Sports are likely as old as mankind in one form or another. We play games when we have the time and ability to do so. And that means we've had a long, long time to develop different sports. Some obviously become popular and take the world by storm, like baseball or soccer. Others are a little more obscure, or in the case of these 10, a lot more obscure. Number 10. Parahawking mixes falconry and paragliding. The sport of paragliding dates back to the 1950s, taking advantage of parachutes which were still a relatively new invention. Falconry, on the other hand, is thousands of years old and was enjoyed throughout the Middle East as much as 5,500 years ago. So a lot of time separates the birth of these two endeavors, and yet somehow they manage to come together in the form of parahawking. Parahawking involves paragliding with falcons or other birds of prey and using them to help find thermal currents and updrafts. It's been practiced for years. There have also been accusations that the sport amounts to animal cruelty and forcing the birds to participate. Number 9. Girl chasing involves a girl on horseback being chased by boys on horseback. The history of mankind is very preoccupied with the idea of pursuing members of the opposite sex. Historically, this has been very much one-sided, with men pursuing, wooing, or even chasing women. And who knows, maybe that's where the Kazakh tradition of girl chasing came from. Unlike the romantic kind of chasing a girl, this one is frenetic and somewhat terrifying since it involves literal chasing on horseback. Kazakh people have historically been some of the greatest horsemen in the world and even invented stirrups, so maybe hunting would be a better name. Nevertheless, this traditional game, also known as Kuzku, is part of Kazakh tradition and dates back generations. The game involves a girl, also on horseback, being chased by boys on horseback. It's something of a race, and there is a predetermined finish line. The boys have to catch the girl before she reaches the line. The upside for her? She has a whip and can use it to chase them. Upside for her? She has a whip. If a boy catches her, he wins a kiss. If the girl escapes, she can whip the boys. Number 8. The Calcico Storico is a violent mix of soccer and boxing. If the media is describing Calcio Storico as the most brutal sport on earth, then you can assume it goes pretty hard. And it does. A mix of soccer and wrestling, or just straight up brawling, this Italian game dates back to the 16th century and involves punching, headbutting, and choking. Are there any rules? Well, there are some. You can't kick anyone in the head or sucker punch them, but other than that, have at it. There is a ball in play and a goal that can be reached to score points. The winner is obviously the team of 27 that scores the most goals. There's a referee, but the game is not sympathetic to those who are injured. If you need to be carried off the field, the gameplay won't stop. There are no player substitutions. In laying waste to your opponent, almost anything goes. If you happen to be an expert in Mai Tai, for example, you're more than welcome to use those skills. Just remember, no head kicks. Also, no teaming up. Fights have to be one on one. Despite being a game, things can get personal, and how could they not? In 2007, officials in Florence banned the game for a year after the match turned into an all out fight that resulted in 50 players going to court. Number 7. Cock borrow is like football, but with a dead goat. People all over the world invented games that involve hitting or otherwise moving a ball towards some goal. The rules change from game to game, but the basic idea is very much the same. But to see just how much the rules can vary from one game to another, check out Cock borrow, a traditional game from Kyrgyzstan that requires players to be on horseback. Also, the ball is traditionally a dead goat. Like American football, the goal is to carry the ball, or in this case, maybe a headless goat, into the end zone of the other team to score. More modern versions of the game don't actually require an actual dead goat, and they'll use a fake stand-in, but it seems people will still do the traditional thing if they can. The game itself may have evolved from shepherds in fields losing some of their flock to wolves. And what else do you do if you have a carcass in your field? Well, maybe have a little fun. Number 6. Inuit Ear Pulling up in the Arctic, sport diversity is a little harder to come by. Sure, there are winter sports played on snow and ice, but what else? For the Inuit people, ear pulling is a sport that doesn't require the frosty outdoors, but will test your pain endurance. One of the events at the annual World Eskimo Indian Olympics in Alaska, which has gone on for more than 60 years now, ear pulling is a two person sport. A string is used to link the ears of competitors looped over the back of each other to tie them together. They then pull away from each other to see who can endure the most discomfort of the string pulling on their ear. It's meant to mimic the pain of frostbite, and unsurprisingly, it has led to injuries in the past. At least one competitor has had the string dig into their ear so badly that they needed seven stitches to close up the wound. Number 5. Spinning combines drifting and acrobatics. If you're a fan of auto sports but find most racing lacks variety, then maybe spinning is the sport for you. Popular in South Africa and called the most reckless sport, it combines the best of drifting with acrobatics in 
a way that makes it seem like someone is going to die at any moment. While a car is set spinning, hence the name, doing donuts and burnouts and so on in a parking lot, the driver of the car may open the door or just hang out of the window, perhaps upside down or in some other death-defying position while the car is basically left to control itself. The spore was born in as unlikely a fashion as the way it plays out. It came from the practice of gangsters stealing cars and then spinning to show off what they'd stolen, becoming a little bit more glamorous and grandiose with the passage of time. Another story claims that it was just created by a guy who thought hanging upside down out of a moving car would be cool. These days, formal competitions are hosted by companies like Red Bull. Number 4. German Wok Racing Luge, bobsled, skiing, and snowboarding all involve someone heading down a snowy hill at high speeds, and you'd think those four sports would have covered all the way you could do such a thing. Turns out that's not quite true, because Germany came up with wok racing. The sport is mostly the same as all the others, with the key difference being that you're heading downhill in a wok. While the sport started as little more than a gimmick, it soon became bafflingly popular. Over 3.6 million Germans tune in to watch televised races. 6,000 fans showed up for the 2010 championship championships, and the sport somehow even managed to sell out with fans and the media lamenting how commercial it became, with every conceivable surface of the athletes being covered in sponsor logos. Number 3. Death Diving is an Extreme Belly Flop Sport there are a good number of sports that require the use of a swimming pool, from diving to water polo to just competitive swimming. One thing most aquatic sports have in common, however, is that if you belly flop into the pool during the course of that sport, you probably messed up. There's no grace to a belly flop, and mostly it's just awkward and painful. So, of course, someone made it a sport, and somehow they made it more dangerous and more painful. Known as dodzing in its native Norway, the sport isn't technically belly flopping from 10 meters in the air, it just could be that. The idea is to jump and hold your body in an X formation with arms and legs out. Then at the last possible moment, draw your arms and legs in to land on the water in a more safe, non-belly flop position. The longer you hold out, the better. And presumably, if your timing is off, you're landing that belly flop. There are national championships every year, and rumor has it that there have been serious injuries ranging from broken noses to punctured lungs. Number 2. Bokchol Spoeg or Kudu Dung Spitting involves spitting antelope poop. You'd be hard pressed to find a lot of people who want to watch Bok Drop Spoeg and even fewer who want to participate. Also known in English as Kudu Dung Spitting, this South African sport requires you to take a pellet of poop from an animal called a kudu, which is a kind of antelope, and then put it in your mouth. You then spit the dirt as far as you can. Whoever spits the farthest is the winner, although it's hard to say anyone is a winner when you're playing a game where you put poo in your mouth. Despite the fact that Kudu is is a decent sized animal, their feces is almost rabbit like in appearance, just little piles of round pellets. It's hard to say what inspired the first person to try the sport. It bears a strong resemblance to just spitting out watermelon seeds, and it's entirely possible it came about when someone put one in their mouth thinking it was food and then spat it out after realizing what it was. No word on how popular the sport is, but it does have a Wikipedia article and you can find videos of it on YouTube, so it's got to count for something. Number one, camel wrestling is mostly what it sounds like. Some sports are very much born of the time and place in which they were created. No one in Idaho was going to invent surfing, and snowboarding was unlikely to come from the Australian outback. So the western parts of Turkey were only going to come up with so many different sports on what was available for people to play around with. And that's how camel wrestling was invented. Amazingly, this sport has a solid 2,400 years of history, and the name isn't metaphorical or misleading in any way. In 2011, 20,000 people showed up to watch camel wrestling in Selkirk, proving just how popular this unusual sport really is. Camels are naturally combative, and they think they're going to mate, and there are other males that they have to compete with. So in the sport, males are exposed to females in heat and then put in an arena together. They have gear on to protect them from biting each other, but otherwise it's just two male camels fighting over a female. The winner either knocks the other camel down or makes it run away. It's been compared to Spanish bullfighting in terms of cultural significance and tradition. Just as curious as the sport is the fact that it really offers no one involved any benefit. The camels don't actually get to breed, and the human owners don't even make any money off of it. It's been called a rich man sport simply because it costs a lot of money and provides fleeting entertainment rewards. The winner of the 2011 tournament got a machine-made rug. 